Hello, Shaler area. I'm glad to see everybody made it, made their way to class safely. This is Mr. Regal's accelerated science class, the first note video. So, um, glad you made it to class. Didn't get lost in the hallway. Find a nice, comfortable seat, and let's sit down and talk about science. So, in this class, uh, Unit One is going to be the first nine weeks. So, Unit One is split into two parts. Uh, part One is about the nature of science, the scientific method. Um, part two is about measurement. And each of those parts is going to have sections where we talk about different aspects of the scientific method or different aspects of um, me the metric system and converting and, and whatnot, analyzing the data. Um, but essentially, unit one is split into two parts. At the end of each of those parts, you'll have a quiz. So we'll take notes on part one, you'll have a quiz on part one. Then we'll take notes on part two, and we'll have a quiz on part two. And then after we have the after we finish the whole note packet at the end of part two, we'll have an exam on the whole unit. And essentially, that's the end of the first nine weeks. And we're going to be doing lots of other things in class in between then, um, but that's that's the structure of what you can expect in the first nine weeks. So let's get started on the note video so you can see what these look like. So make sure you have your note packet out. If you look down through your note packet, you'll see blanks. Um, so in this PowerPoint, in this video, we will fill those blanks in and talk about examples. So unit one, how science gets done. And this is the first note video in part one. And it's what is physical science? It's the class that you are sitting in right now. Well, if we go all the way back, the word science itself comes from the Latin language which many of you have or will be having this year. And the word science translates to having knowledge. So it kind of makes you think that science is about knowing things. A better definition of science, though, is that science is the way we gather information. If you want to know something, you may have to do a lot of different things to figure out what that is. You may have to do some reading, you may have to do some experimentation, um, you may have to do a lot of talking with others. All of those things put together is science. Science is, is a process. Science is ongoing. Science is not so much about knowing the facts, um, but it's more about the journey that it took to discover them. I'm going to talk about that. That a lot. We're going to talk about the process of learning this year, more so than necessarily just knowing things. So science itself is broken into three uh, really broad groups. Last year you focused on this one, life science. Uh, the life science is the study of anything that's, that is or was alive. Uh, earth, sci earth science you did uh, down at the Scott Avenue building and you'll do more of it at the high school. Earth science is essentially the study of the processes of the planet, volcanoes, earthquakes, that kind of thing, uh, and also anything that happens on other planets would be earth, earth science. Physical science is what we're going to be doing this year, and physical science itself can be broken into two groups. Physics, which is the study of motion and the forces that are behind and cause those motions and chemistry, which is the study of matter and what, what it's made up of. So if you take a minute right now, put your palms of your hands together and push against each other as hard as you possibly can. You'll feel your muscles tense, your arms will start to shake, start to get some blood pumping in your arms there. If you think about the forces, the actual pulling of the muscles, the contracting of the muscles, the actual pushing of the hand back and forth, the, those motions and the forces of, in the muscles, that's physics. So that would be how a physicist would look at that situation. If you were a chemist and you were doing the same, <clears throat> the, if you were a chemist and you were doing the same exact activity, pushing your arms together like that, you might be thinking more about uh, what's happening in the skin, uh, in, the, in like the, the proteins that make up the, the, the hands, how they can flatten and broaden out like that. You might, you might be thinking about the reactions that's happening in the muscle cells so that you can actually generate the energy to move and create all of that force. Um, so if you're talking about what, is made, what something is made up of, you're talking about chemistry. If you're talking about how something moves, you're talking about physics. So 
So we are going to discuss some important skills that all scientists have to have. If you don't have these skills, it would be very tough being a scientist. All scientists need to be able to make observations. Now, you make observations with a lot more things than just your eyes. You use all of your senses to gather information when you're, when you're making observations. And there's two kinds of observations that you make. The first, these are your first two big vocab terms. The first is quantitative. Quantitative. Notice the, the beginning of the word is quant, like quantity. A quantitative observation deals with numbers. It wants to know how much of something there is, how many of something that there is. And then the next word is very similar to quantitative, but it is qualitative. Qualitative observations don't deal with numbers. And it has the, the beginning uh, word like quality. You're talking about the qualities of something. So if you take a minute, look at whatever shirt you're wearing, shirt, shorts, skirt, whatever, and flip the bottom edge of the fabric over and look at the stitching in the hem. Take a minute to actually like look and see how your, your, clothes, your clothes are put together and sewn. Um, it was probably a machine that did this one. If you were to count how many stitches there were on that entire seam, that would be a quantitative observation. If you were to count how many stitches there were per, per centimeter, that would be a quantitative observation. But if you were to look at the fabric and look at the threads and see how tightly the, the stitches are pulled, see if any of them are fraying, see if the um, threads themselves are they made of nylon or they made of cotton, those would be qualitative type observations. Now you may notice in the notes off to the right, uh, there's a picture of a scientist. Um, he's standing there in a lab coat, some kind of chem scientist guy. That is the first aura that you'll find in the note packet. Um, one of the apps that you downloaded is Erasma, and Erasma lets you pull videos out of the note packet to watch. Uh, the videos that are embedded and hidden in the note packet are there for your uh, enrichment, entertainment, learn something new. I think they're kind of cool. Um, so you'll have to look through the iPad at that guy's picture. Um, and if you do that with the Erasma app, then the first video should come out. And if you like watching the Erasma videos in the notes, there is an optional homework assignment where if you watch the videos, you can answer questions, turn it in, and get a reward in class. The second skill that all scientists need to have, so not only do you need to be able to make observations like seeing and hearing and tasting and touching things, you also need to be able to make inferences and predictions. An inference is when you try to explain something that you've observed. So it's, it's how our brains explain observations so that things make sense. So for example, let's say, let's say you were shopping for a house and you walk into a house, the, um, the realtor is showing you around, the house is all empty, there's no furniture in there, but you smell something. It smells really good. It kind of makes you feel at home, um, kind of makes, makes you feel, feel safe. And you walk in and the realtor is waiting for you to come show you the house and he's baking chocolate chip cookies in the oven. This is actually a, a pretty funny trick that realtors do do to try to make you like a house better. They'll put chocolate chip cookies in the oven and it makes you feel nice. So you look at the house, eh, the chocolate chip cookies didn't, didn't do anything for you. The house is actually not very nice. So you go to the next house. There's another realtor. You walk in, you smell chocolate chip cookies. You're like, huh, I see what's going on here. And you walk in, but this guy is not making chocolate chip cookies. He's actually just burning a candle. You inferred from the smell that he was baking cookies. So you have to be careful when you make inferences, because inferences aren't always correct. You smelled the same thing, so you thought the same reality was happening, but that's not what was going on. Inferences are something that you have to really be cognizant of when you're doing experiments, because when you record data, you have to make sure you're just recording what you're measuring. 
um, or what you're seeing. You can't ever record what you think you're seeing or what you think you're smelling because um, inferences can throw everything out the window. So on the other hand, predictions. Um, predictions are things that you can, once you have enough wisdom, you can kind of predict the future. So if you went to see a third house, you could predict after seeing the first two and smelling chocolate chip, cook chocolate chip cookies that the third house would also smell like chocolate chip cookies. In general, keep them straight. Inferences are things that happened in the past. Predictions are things that haven't happened yet or will happen in the future. I just like this painting. Um, this is uh, it's actually a painting by one of my, my favorite artists, uh, or a drawing rather. There's a few other pictures of his up in the classroom. Uh, if anybody can tell me who the artist is, it's worth a prize in class. All right, the third skill that all scientists need to be able to do is all scientists need to be able to group things. That's really, really important in science, that you can see patterns in characteristics of things. So if I'm looking at a group of 100 things and I see the same exact, you know, coloration, feather structure or whatever uh, in, in birds and be able to put those into a group and talk about them as a group and talk about what they have in common. <clears throat> you already naturally do this. Your dresser at home, you probably keep like, you know, all your shirts in one drawer, all your socks in another. Maybe you stuff your socks in with your underwear. You got your pants down at the bottom because they're heavy. Um, so you, you're, you already know how to do this. You do it for school too. You have your binder, you have your different folders. I uh, have a folder for English, a folder for reading. We're actually going to have a little game that we're going to play in class with classifying to see, uh, to see just how, how handy you are at doing this, how adept you are at that skill. The last skill that all scientists need to be able to have is the ability to make models. A model is something that scientists make when doing the real thing isn't exactly the best option. Um, sometimes it's really complicated, sometimes it's really dangerous, um, sometimes it's just too expensive, and, and honestly, sometimes we make models because we're talking about things that you actually can't see. Um, for example, everyone's seen this picture. This is sort of the newest model of the atom. It's actually, there's one newer than this, but everyone can recognize this as the atom. Well, is this what an atom looks like? Some of you might be nodding your head and saying, sure. We have no idea. This is a model of an atom. Atoms are too small to see. No one's ever seen an atom. So we use illustrations like this in models to try to explain and visually show what hundreds of millions of lines of numbers and data are telling us about measurements of things. So we look at all those measurements, we use it to construct a model, and it's much easier for like students or just anybody to look at this instead of looking at mountains of numbers of calculations. Maps are really good models too. Imagine if instead of looking at this map, which gives you a million points of information all, all in about three seconds, you had to read a book that talked about the exact path that this arrow came down, which um, like the angle, the, uh, you know, the time that they were going, the mountain range that they're crossing, and then he turned right at this tree, and then, he, and then he stopped at this river, and then you have to go this way, and then you have to do that for all of the lines. So much information is found in just this model, it would take forever to try to explain all of that in words. So this takes us to the end of the first note video. You will see um, little spots like this throughout your note packet that say booby trap on them. Booby traps are, when you come to class, um, you should have these notes taken. Um, you should take the time to review them and learn the vocabulary that's in them because when you come to class on a booby trap day, uh, this one has seven questions. You can see where it says right in here. So this is the unit, unit one. It's the first booby trap in unit one, and this is just a code that I sometimes put on things. It's unit one, it's a booby trap, and it's the first one. So when you come to class, you will each get your own clicker. It's like a remote control and questions will come up on the screen and you will all respond individually and um, see how much you learn from these note packets. So it's a good tool for you. It gives you feedback as to whether or not you're actually learning at the pace that we're going in class, if you're keeping up with the, with the uh, material or not. 
So I hope you enjoyed the uh, first note video. Hope it wasn't too boring. Um, hope I didn't stretch it out too long. And uh, I hope you look forward to watching number two.